if Maury had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah. 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 Sending out good vibes. 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 breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. These, these events might not have been a complete surprise. You'd be able to monitor this comet as it's orbiting around. And probably there'd be maybe, you know, 10 years or maybe even 100 years when you can see that this comet keep, is getting sort of closer and closer. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. We are going to be chatting with Martin Sweatman a little bit later. Uh, Gobekli Tepe decoded... And I, I think the gist of it is basically he thinks he's discovered, and he may well have uh, this ancient, the ancient zodiac. So if we have our zodiac today with Cancer and Taurus and everything else, he thinks that uh, he has found the old one, the one they were using before the younger Dryas, uh, before they buried Gobekli Tepe. And we'll find out. See what you think. We'll leave it up to you guys to decide. Uh, of course, we got everyone's favorite co-hostess with the mostest over here, Graham. I finally got a tattoo, Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? Good. How you doing? You got a tattoo on that massive calf? I did, yeah. Did he comment on it when he was, was it hard to tattoo into? Was it hard to get the ink into or anything? You falling for it? Falling for what? It's a temporary tattoo. Oh, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I just assumed you got a tattoo. Hey, me and Grimstake have a pact. No tattoos, man. Think before you ink, Darren. Yeah, that's why we're doing. I think Grimstake is just scared. I gave him. I gave them a my card. No, I didn't. I took their card because I didn't have any on me. I should have. But <clears throat> to make a template for Grand Americans, Are to they make a template good? and they spray, you can airbrush it on. Well, but I. Oh, I was looking at temporary tattoos actually. But I'm glad it's good enough to fool you, dude. Well, I didn't really look at it, to be perfectly honest. I, no, it's, no, I can totally tell it's not real now. I just assumed you got a tattoo. I seen the picture of the chats you were alluding to you got a tattoo. <laughs> I didn't think you were just, it was an elaborate yarn. I'm a little disappointed. You should have unk. Nah. No? No. Can't do it? No. I ain't a tattoo you once when you pass out. I don't pass out anymore. <laughs> Good luck with that one. I'll choke you out first. We should start beeping. Just keep an eye on it. If, I, if my tongue makes it up to my pineal gland, then then I, all my senses go away. Like, I'm in the Yeah, because you're dead. <laughs> you can so no longer void, breathe you and you're can, dead. You can tattoo me. Okay. If I get to so Graham's point. trying to stick his tongue into his nose from the back, which I think is going to result in him choking no, himself no, to no, death. No, it's fine. You, how, you can breathe through your nose still. How? Not if you block your throat, you can't. Mm -hmm. You understand the importance of not passing out on your back? That's down your throat. This is up your nasal <laughs> cavity. This is a big difference. Like then it's blocking both. <laughs> it's blocking your throat from your mouth, and then you're blocking your nose. Then go without breath for like three minutes, so then I have time to bring it back down. Hopefully. You'll be trying to find you with your fingers in your mouth. <laughs> Telling you just keep a pocket knife. You give yourself an emergency tracheotomy. Just stab yourself right in the thing there and stick a pen in there. You breathe through that. Just in case. I'm telling you. All right, buddy. It's like, you know what comes to mind when you start talking about that? It makes me think of the guys that hang themselves and they jerk off. I don't know why, but that's what came to my mind. You mean hang themselves, like just like choke themselves out? You mean yeah. Like? Well, they ejaculate. So, you know, they find these guys dead. Oh, really? Yeah. Why, because they slip or something? Yeah, they slip oh. or they take it too far. Oh, wow. It's Who's they? Like, I don't know, man. You should know. This is a grab question. <laughs> this is totally your area of expertise. <laughs> I don't know if standing in quite that, <laughs> quite that specific of a practice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I would hold off more than choke myself, you know. You'd blue ball it? Yeah. Absolutely. We know it. What do you want to get into first, man? I don't know. I got a I got a pretty long email, and I got some some video clips from. We're not getting into your clips. Today. Some uh, geoengineering fuckery and stuff like that. Oh, we have the Dave Matheson. 
promo to play at some point, oh, yeah, either yeah, this show or next show. Yeah, we should ask for support at some point. We should ask for some sh- support. Um, you know, we should support the show. I didn't. I didn't grab a quote either, but I can find one on the fly here. Well, let's here. Actually, I should do this know. because Felix sent us this jingle forever ago, and oh, I've they? never played really? it on the show. Really? Oh, Felix. Which is probably why he stopped sending jingles. That's probably so, why. Why don't we get a little housekeeping out of the way? Housekeeping. <laughs> housekeeping. Time for us to handle law business on the ground. America show. Little bit louder now. Housekeeping segment. I don't actually have any housekeeping, I don't think. What's housekeeping? It's all housekeeping, really. It's asking for, well, yeah, listener emails and asking for support and stuff. It's all part of the housekeeping. Hey, what kind of email do you got? Are you getting any quotes right away? Because I finally got the new jingle on the quote board. Oh, here's this one. This one will make you sad. As some of you may have heard by now, Darren and Graham have had to close up shop on the Igloo, <laughs> their makeshift podcast studio. But don't cry now. I love the acoustic guitar. It's time for you to subscribe now. It hurts so bad to say goodbye to the igloo. <laughs> Many excellent interviews. Makes me a little nostalgic. The igloo. The tarp came off the igloo. But Darren and Graham will pull themselves <laughs> up by their We have to move it onto the top of the sea can soon. But Brad said Getting we could use the fourth one. With a little help from your Grimerica subscription. Subscription. Cha-ching. Well, I wasn't quite expecting that, but that was a good segue in to support the show. We'll get it out of the way early. You guys can just... Thanks, Felix. Yeah. Uh, Grimerica.ca slash support, guys. We've been releasing extra content for a couple of weeks now. I mean, I think we released a lot of podcasts in the last five, six weeks. In uh, our little trick... Instead of bitching and complaining, we thought we'd be happy, be thankful for the support we've got, hang our heads up high, and blast out a shitload more content. Yep. So that's what we've been doing. And we've been hoping that it would be that our that our new that our added value, hopefully to your lives, would be met with some added value in our lives. And to a certain extent it has. We are about uh, one fifth of the way to our drive to hundred new supporters. So that's better than I expected to do. We've got about half a month left. We're going to have to giddy up. Uh, Grandmarket.ca slash support. Sign up for monthly. If we can get the other uh, 80 people on board, then we can get someplace. We'll keep doing the extra content. Yep. If not, we might have to roll it back a little bit because we might think you guys might not like the content too much, which is okay. Well, we can't keep up two weeks we- anyways. I mean, it's impossible. Almost. Almost. We could do two a week for three weeks out of four probably. You have to have some air in there for shows like tonight. The show was canceled, postponed. We happens just, all the time. We just do our own show. No. I interview you. Okay. About your fake tattoo. Can I do like in a fake voice and stuff? Yeah. It'll <laughs> be fun. We, we'll interview. You get to be someone famous in history. <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> but you have to be able to do a good voice and keep it up the whole time. Be like, I'm Nikola Tesla. I'll, I'm so bad at I'll use a voice rec- I'll use a voice mon- uh like, like the, the one that Uncle Trussell had that changes your voice? Uncle Trussell? What? Uncle Trussell? You just can't say that name. It's weird. Uh, where were we? We've completely derailed about, the public. About oh, support the show. About extra content. We've been doing this extra content. <laughs> Grimerica.ca slash support. Like I say, we'd let, we're, um, we're just seeing if it's appreciated or not. Head over to the support page and let us know. And if, like I say, if we do hit that number, we'll be... We'll be hard pressed to keep going. Uh, if not, we could just back off whenever we want. America.ca slash support. We love you. You also do get those black budget shows, which I think is about another fifty shows in yep, there. For so any right amount now. at all. Any amount. Bang. Any One time donation. Yep. Uh, we'll hopefully do, monthly. Hopefully monthly. I mean, let's be let's be honest. We can't budget on uh we can't bud- make budgetary decisions on one-time donations. That's right. And they help, though. They're, they help. They're, they're great to get. They're great. They're good yeah. for like, hey, we need a fridge yeah, or something like that. Or we do need a fridge. We need a cord. Right? We still haven't got a fridge. A little hot plate and a fridge. We yeah. can just bunker in here, That's hunker it. in here. Well, I have the Coleman, but the thing is, if we cook too long in the Coleman, we'll die. What? Because it's propane? Or? Yeah. 
I think it's big enough in here. Probably be okay. Yeah, it's, an, it's, we're it's just drafty throwing, enough. We're not the, having a party. We're just yeah. doing a couple quick burgers or something. Yeah, we could do that now. And then we're fighting the algos. All I have the time. some rice now. We could have some rice. Right? I don't want rice. Me either. We're fighting the algos. So another other ways to help is obviously share the show with people. That's you like guys really, aren't sharing the show enough. That's, that's what you don't sure. have to come down hard on them. I'm just okay. saying, like you're the good. Cop. And then and then uh, review the show. That helps too, right? Yeah. Like us on YouTube. All that. There's a platform of YouTube as well. Like us and do all that. Subscribe well, on YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube. Help, you know, subscribe on YouTube. Rate us and review us on iTunes if you can. Yeah. Because again, the the review <clears throat> the review uh, ratio is less than the support ratio. But I got to give that a bit of leeway because not everyone li- listens on an Apple device. I don't know where you review a podcast on Spotify. Yeah, you can. There's a Spotify reviews. I'm sure. You just guess. I thought you used to send them over from the review. never from Spotify. Those are all from iTunes. Really? Those are all from iTunes. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, but I mean, if you can't review the show wherever you're listening, maybe you can make an iTunes account just so you could review the show. I mean, if we're that special to you, or you could buy swag as well. You could buy swag. Gramerica.ca slash swag. We get a couple bucks from chats. all of that stuff. Gramerica.ca slash chats. Get the fuck off of social media. Get into the chats. It's better for you. You'll live longer and you'll feel better. Not even joking. I got a good uh, email that, that would sort of build upon that and transition us into that. Stop on by, stop on by, stop on by, stop on by. The whole, stop on by, I listened to the whole cruising mistake debacle Ooh. last night. Uh, what debacle? I don't know. I should, I should call it a debacle. Why would you call it a debacle? Well, it's a two year live show. I oh, emailed I a couple realize. times. Oh, they sh- didn't read my email. Oh my God. I was they disappointed. Just all together. They're like, all of email now the and work. we'll read your email. So I instant, I was like, oh, I'll send them an email. So I instantly email? emailed. No, it mail. was nice. Oh, well, that's why. It was semi hate mail. You know me. I'm never that nice. <sighs> it was semi hate mail. <clears throat> Anyways, what was your point? I c- congratulated their stick to itiveness. That's great. Yeah. And they didn't fucking read it. So I shut it off. Well, actually, I listened to as much as I could. And then uh, I was think it? I got a phone call. It was pretty good. I was going to call in, but they didn't give out the number. I don't know if it's call in show or not. Felix was on there. I don't know where I was going with Congratulations, that. Congratulations, Grimstake. Yeah, that's where I was going. Congratulations on two year anniversary, yeah. guys. Yeah. I don't have a congratu- congratulations jingle. So, what are you, you going to read the email that mm-hmm. has to do with the chats in? Any, oh, that's where I was going with that. That whole show is a fucking side effect of the chats oh that's what i was gonna say yeah yeah yeah, yeah we we spawn podcasts in grand america don't do that don't say it like that especially when you're looking at me like that it's weird it's like we procreated we, we have <laughs> <laughs> friends and allies in the community and other podcasts <laughs> all right this is a great email from sab allies hi guys <laughs> I just finished listening to the most of the episode with the American doctor you interviewed. Now that I'm a subscriber and a monthly donator, I feel that I've done enough to allow myself the opportunity to contribute to content. Maybe? LOL. Anyway, I have some knowledge after spending almost two years looking into the Graham Hancock, etc. type researchers and podcasts now. And I'm starting to understand why, or sorry, how the ancients, ancients used medicine, healthcare practices a little. I'm not sure if you've interest in interviewed Michael Tellinger yet. No, we haven't. But he has stumbled across earth healing, for lack of a better term. He claims that several of his clients that came from South Africa to our ancient ruins with him have reported amazing health improvements. Even a cure of cancer from the patient that was given six months to live. An American woman. Also living in Australia, I have found that the traditional healers of the indigenous peoples have cured a stroke victim that couldn't walk for 10 years, tried everything, she got up and walked after one session. I have no doubt that it's all connected, that these healers have learned to channel earth energy somehow and use its power to cure patients. I believe that the pyramids around the globe all use the same earth energy for whatever reason they were set up for, meaning some pyramids might have been around or it might have been for sound residents, which when broadcasted would have been able to influence the vicinity's population with positive or healing energy or maybe even negative energy. Oof. Or whatever energy they were specifically built to admit. Remember the Great Pyramid of Giza 
is tuned to a specific music sound frequency. And I'm sure all the pyramids are as well, but maybe different frequencies. Hmm. I have personally experienced the healing process of sound waves. I spent 25 to 30 years in extreme pain from a serious f- fracture in my elbow. I underwent surgery on the same joint about five to six times, and it was a lifelong pop problem until a physio tried an ultrasound machine. Instantly, all my pain went away, and now 10 years on, and this, it has still fixed my pain issues. When I get any pain, I pull out my $200 dollar ultrasound machine and the sound waves fix my pain geez that's interesting the ultrasound machine maybe i need to get one for maria i am an ultrasound machine (laughs) (laughs) miami ultrasound oh that's like if you're a singer i guess that'd be more fitting for a singer yeah than a podcaster that's a good idea though see i always forget that the ones in physio are actually just like ultrasound I seen an a, I seen an AM what is it ASMR site the other day where mm-hmm. Buddy was just eating a burger. Yep. Like there's a how do you get into that gig? Buddy's got like fucking seventy five thousand subscribers. He's eating burgers and fries in his microphone. That's a good gig. Yeah. I could eat shit on the microphone. I don't yeah. think I could do it. Is he on video? It's see he's yeah, on video. He's just yeah, like, it's just a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if that's healing. No, that's not here. Oh, I don't it know. Maybe it is I mean, for that, some that people. whole shiver, the whole shiver mechanism that works. You think it that's might something I got to some get over? Or something like that? That's trauma. Maybe you got meat trauma from when you were still like you know, well, you, from you were getting eaten by wolves well, in the, the past same, life. No, it's not about the eating. It's about the sound. It's like the first note of a couple songs or a song that resonates with you. Like I always have a couple songs that resonate with me that make me shiver like that. All right, let's hear your email. You're just sick. As soon as I get sick of it. <laughs> you didn't want to hear what song? Okay, like Stand song? or Fall by the Fix. I don't know who that is. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> we could have saved all that. <laughs> I'll check it out. I have Spotify. There in the Miami ultrasound machine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'm <laughs> flying to Adelaide in a couple of weeks to take my children to a Nangakari healer. Which are the people that fix the stroke victim I mentioned. Anyway, my point is that the stuff isn't known about because like Tesla and his free power, the powers that rule us don't want being cured for free. They don't want people being cured for free. But I can no longer ignore this technology. And I wanted to fill you guys in a bit. So maybe you could take advantage of it also. Or your family and friends. You mentioned about friends and family spending thousands on health care, so I just wanted to get this information to you to see if it could be of any use. Maybe Michael Tellinger could be an option as a guest as well, but he does have some weird views regarding space program and flat earth. Have you heard some of Graham's views? Anyway, sorry if my email doesn't really flow with decent narrative qualities or grammar, etc. I'm just pushing this out as quickly as I can while I have a minute. Keep going with your great work and what I can send... If uh, he says send updates, if he does these healing sessions after he does them, healing is free, but we just have to find it. Big Pharma certainly don't want this information in the public domain, but hows get <laughs> hows get fuck sound for them. Anyway, cheers. Take care from Sab in Australia. Die, mate. That was a good one, eh? Yeah, thanks, buddy. Oh, another shrimp on a barbie. <laughs> no, I feel like there's a. A whole whack of these alternatives that'll work, but it's what resonates with you and what you're ready for. Like, I believe that it's people healing themselves. It's just, this is a platform or a, or a placebo exploitation or something for, for that healing to take place, you know, because it won't work for everybody, but sometimes the miracle happens and it just depends on what clicks. What, yeah. What clicks. I mean, that could be what modern medicine is doing too. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. With the placebo? Get out a pen and paper and write this down. Or a pencil. Why don't you send some that, physical mail to the Grimerica show? That the organ, jingles are that tough. Organ, that that organ, organ in the background reminds me of like Slapshot, you know? 100-815, comma, 17. Yeah, the hockey, the hockey, it's the hockey Next fucking line. organ. Uh-huh. Calgary, Alberta. Next line. Uh-huh. Canada. Next line. Uh-huh. T2T space 5H7. That's the PO box. Why don't you send 
Aren't you saying Darren some dirty socks? Because he's got a dirty sock fetish. <laughs> I predict quarterly pay. Yep. From friend of the show, Nikki the Dude. You know, Nikki was... Uh, so we got some mail from the P.O. Box. This is not a bill. I think people get that from the jingle. Uh, Nikki said it was he knew that there was a Grand American trimester at CAC because when he introduced some people were like uh hey we're whoever and he's like oh i'm nikki and they're like the dude <laughs> okay we have a card this is how grateful i am thanks for the greenbacks nikki trust me awesome. it's a lot more than it looks so nice to get to spend time with y'all and the families, plus all the Grimericans that made it to CAC 2019. See y'all soon. Nikki the Dude. Thanks, Nikki. We love you, buddy. Sends us a nice card every yep. quarter. With some and then we 20, have with some American 20s in it. Thanks, Nikki. We have another package here for Nikki as well, I, th I think. This yeah. Nikki's son was uh, one of the ones that saw the, the UFO slithering through the sky at CAC, like basically a large snake with hundreds of lights in it. He was like, I can't even call that a UFO because it wasn't flying. It was slithering. Oh. Oh. Jeez, he found another green one in there. It's uh, 18 hummingbirds, quotes and poetry. So Darren flipped through the pages just to make sure, and sure enough, there was some money in there. A gift from the view. Whenever... Uh, Nikki sends a book. You got to make sure you check. So, shit. It fell out. I don't know what page it was on. I think it was on this page. The Last Hummingbird. Sometimes I see one, two, three, then four. I dread the cold when I see no more. The hum of the sweet song that you play comforts me as the dawn breaks. Spread your tiny wings float on the breeze surround yourself in warmth and ease i will see you in spring when you take flight surprise me in a new season's sunlight i can't read the author oh that was beautiful i think i'm gonna do a poem a week all right thanks nikki you added a segment to the show Thank you for the wonderful hummingbird poem. And thank that, you for the greenbacks. Is that uh, donated for based uh, or in memory of the hummingbird that was saved at CAC? Saved by my daughters. Well, I think somebody else actually and saved Garrett. it. I think no, I think it was mainly um, and Archer. Archer did it really. I think he did the final. Archer push. and Garrett, and yeah, and then the girls were very involved. Yeah, they're very proud of themselves. Shout out to the girls. So, the, so it was May. No, April. It April. was May. May. Oh. And it was so cold your that the car, hummingbirds Your froze. car registration had expired in April. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I made it across borders. So Graham that. drove across borders and states uh, with an expired license. It's just Wait. a fake. It, you know, it's such a joke anyways. It was all insured. If you're not registered, register you're, 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 your insurance is void. Yeah. So There's no say. way the insurance company is paying if your car is not right. They're gonna. That's like an easy out. It almost didn't start there that one morning, too, that cold morning. Something was weird. You're way the fuck up the mountain. Yeah. Like, way up the mountain. Yeah. Not much oxygen up there. That wasn't why. <laughs> you got a better solution, bud? Did we have to boost it? No. Nope. It just No, nope, just active? a mechanically inclined guy came over to look, and then it started. <laughs> That's what happens. I get it. I think it was Ryan. Ryan from Kansas. I think he just started your car for you. Yeah. No, Ryan. I started it when he was there watching because it <laughs> makes me feel like an idiot. It's just <laughs> not working for me. That's like being with computers. It's like the IT guy comes by and just looks and stands there and then it works for Sometimes you. Sometimes I just have to touch stuff. Sometimes it just it drives a family nuts. It's like, oh, what's what's not working? Just, oh, ding, ding. Well, it seems fine. <laughs> Where were we? I don't know, but I got some. I got some geoengineering to talk about. Uh, really? I need the clipcord. You can do that now. I can save it, but why don't we save it and we'll uh, do your? Let's do your quote, and then we'll do the. Oh yeah, I do have a quote. CAC promo, and then we'll do the uh, save that other stuff for the next intro. Okay. 
if you don't mind. That's fine with me. No. This is from the Octopus of Global Control. Are you going to do the I jingle? Can't I can't find the jingle. You just set up the jingle. The board. jingle. I just put it on here. Don't start reading until I play the fucking jingle, or we're going to have a problem. Uh, there's too many jingles now. There's four pages of these. Uh, do you see it on this page? I can't even see over there. Page two. Can you do a little search? Some of you may have heard by now. I can play them all at once. <laughs> what a knob. I was sure it was on the first page here. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what to say. You might get this one. So this is from the chapter in... The Octopus of Global Control, Goose Step into a One World Government. You ready for this one, Darren? Like it didn't So say unfortunately, it. what we've got here for the first time on a global scale is a conspiracy of the governing class worldwide against the governed. I'm still looking for the jingle. So I think what we are now facing is the nightmare that every lover of freedom found it. has dreaded. Now we're starting over. It's the profound quote of the week. What happened there? Good job. <laughs> okay, look, it just wasn't meant to be. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what we are facing now is the nightmare that every lover of freedom has dreaded. That the worldwide governing class would find an excuse to gang up together against the people's interest, against liberty, against democracy, against prosperity, against capitalism, against every form of freedoms, which we have for too long and too dangerously taken for granted. Uh, that was Lord Christopher Monckton, British consultant, policy advisor, and author. I never. I think he was quite a controversial figure in his final days, and I think he passed away a couple of years ago. So I bet you this quote is way older than it sounds. All right. Are you going to do another one from the other book? No. Come on. No. Nope. Why not? I need to. Oh, no, I don't. Never mind. I don't need any time. Ready? So our buddy Dave, friend of the show, Dave Masson, you guys know him, been on a bunch of times. He's going to be contact at the cabin uh uh, presenter this year, along with Brandon Powell, who we had on last week, he went out and made this fantastic YouTube video, which is like better than any CAC promo we've ever done or made. So we're just adopting it as our promo. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Looking forward to meeting you under the stars. Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and I'm very excited to announce a special opportunity in conjunction with Darren Grimes and Graham Dunlop of the Grimerica Show podcast as part of their ongoing Contact at the Cabin events, where Darren and Graham invite a previous guest to meet up somewhere in the world and give listeners an up-close adventure centered on an area of research related to consciousness, ancient history, and other related subjects. Most recently, Darren and Graham invited Randall Carlson to contact at the cabin 2019, which was held in Pagosa Springs, Colorado this past May, exploring the evidence of catastrophism in the geologic record in the United States and planet Earth. Next year, for contact at the cabin April 2020, we will be converging on Bryce Canyon and Zion Canyon in Utah, where we will explore the star myths of the world while surrounded by the night sky in one of the best stargazing locations in North America. And Brandon Powell will be giving a full course on the Wim Hof method of breathing techniques, cold exposure, and mind-body control. In addition to these amazing subjects, there will also be plenty of time to just hang out and spend time together along with Darren and Graham and guests from around the world 
And this year's Contact at the Cabin will also be hosted by Russ and Kyle Allen of the Brothers of the Serpent podcast. And the ticket price includes lodging or camping. There's different prices for different types of lodging. It includes the lodging or the camping and the food, the transportation from the Las Vegas airport, which is one of the least expensive airports to fly into in the United States. So it includes lodging, food, transportation from the Las Vegas airport in vans that are provided by Russ and Kyle and Darren and Graham. And of course, all the conversations and presentations and stargazing and visits to the Bryce Canyon and Zion Canyon National Parks. While we cannot predict or guarantee the weather, we selected a location for this event that is in the middle of the high desert and has some of the most amazing night skies that we can find anywhere. Contact at the cabin this year will take place from Thursday, April 16th through Sunday, April 19th, 2020. And there will be a new moon on April 22nd. So that means that this year's event will be held during an ideal time for stargazing when the waning crescent moon is rising during the early hours of the morning. And so that should allow for a beautiful night sky, beautiful night sky views from the special locations that we've chosen for the stargazing. Here's a simulated night sky for Saturday, April 18th from the location of Bryce Canyon, we'll be able to see some of the most mythologically important constellations, and I'll be pointing them out for you to see in person for yourself as we discuss the role of these specific constellations in the world's ancient myths and scriptures. And I know that for some guests, this may be the very first time that you're able to see and identify some of the amazing constellations that we'll be pointing out during this event. They'll be crossing the sky during this time of year, including the constellation Hercules, the constellation Virgo, the constellation Boötes, the constellation Coma Berenices, the constellation Hydra, the constellation Leo the Lion, the constellation Cancer the Crab, which includes the mythologically important Beehive Cluster, the Twins of Gemini, and many others. We'll explore the role of these important constellations and others in the world's ancient myths and scriptures, including the stories of the Bible, the myths of ancient India, the myths of ancient Egypt, the myths of ancient Mesopotamia, the myths of ancient Greece, the Norse myths, the life of the Buddha, the life of Bodhidharma or Dhammo, the sacred stories of the Americas and of Africa and of the Pacific Islands and other sacred traditions around the world. What a great Again, video. We're not able to guarantee the weather, but we're choosing New moon time and New moon location that should be as conducive. We have as a lot of intentional power in the group. Grams and affirmed cloud Bryce Canyon and the high desert of Utah are known for having some of the absolute best stargazing opportunities on earth. I very much hope that you can find a way to attend the upcoming Contact at the Cabin for April 2020 at Bryce and Zion Canyons in Utah with hosts Darren and Graham of Grimerica, Russ and Kyle of the Brothers of the Serpent, and speakers Brandon Powell and myself. It should be a very special, one-of-a-kind event that will inspire you and bring you closer to nature, to the ancient myths, and to your authentic self. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Couldn't have said it better myself. Fantastic. Wouldn't have tried to. That is now the new promo for CAC. Right on. Sure. Wonder if he'll do next year, too. No, that's fantastic. Couldn't have said it better myself. Contact at thecabin.com. I'll finish it off by just saying this. As of yesterday, which would have been July, what, 15th or 16th, uh, we were at 50% sold and i've still got another like 10 people on the email list that said they were coming that uh haven't actually you know made 
I need some, if you're, if you think you're coming and we haven't had a firm conversation that you're coming and picked your lodging, what, what lodging level you want yet, then I don't have you marked on the spreadsheet. So you better get a hold of me. Most of the people on the, you know, that, that involves giving a deposit of some sort to get started. And then we can do a payment plan from there if need be. But, uh, we're 50% deposited and another 40% or 30% at least is technically people say they're coming, but haven't committed yet. So I wouldn't fuck around. We do, we've got a slight expandability on this. We're looking at, there's two more cabins there. How many there. people in total are going so far? Or like, how many do we plan on? Hosting? 35 or 36. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But you might be able to, if, if that sells out quick and there's enough interest, we might be able to add eight to that. There's another cabin next door we can yeah. look at. But uh, it'd be out of the house lodging. You'd be staying at the cabin next door now, not, you know, so not with the rest of the group, which you might like. But, uh, and that's not a guarantee. So at this point, you know, there's somewhere between six and 18 spots left for CAC uh, Matheson. And Dave hasn't gone on a single podcast yet. He's getting ready to go on Tripoli right away. He's getting ready to go on. He hasn't even come on our show yet to discuss it. We've barely even really started talking about it. That's the thing that worries me is there's probably members of the audience that haven't even caught up to the shows yet. But uh, anyway. There's going to be lots of cacks. That's right. There'll be cacks everywhere. Uh, contact at the cabin. We do one a month, one day. Check out contact at the cabin.com. Currently, the next event's the only one up there as we start getting some more closer to finalized plans. We'll pop them up, them up as well. But uh, yeah, don't fuck around. Contact at the cabin.com. Get a deposit in right away if you think you're coming. Like I said, there's somewhere between six and 18 spots left. So yeah, hurry up. Anything else? That's it. That's it. Enjoy the chat. Across the pond, we've got Dr. Martin Sweatman with us. He's a chemical engineer and a researcher and the author of Prehistory Decoded. He's got a YouTube channel as well talking about this stuff. And uh, thanks for coming on the show, Martin. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, like we were talking about, we just spent, you know, like 10 days with Randall Carlson and we got quite a bit of, in, in um, you know, theory about, about some of the stuff that you talk about in your book as well and that you've been researching. So I don't know where, maybe we should start at like... You know, you're you're a scientist um, already, and then you've you've kind of got into this um, writing about ancient history, like Gobekli Tepe, and and decoded some of that. So I think a good place to start would be, you know, the genesis of that and that transition. Because I mean, I've I've, I've read a couple uh, you know skeptical takes on your book as well, and and you know, <laughs> they they don't seem too happy with <laughs> with a with a you know, a preordained scientist going after all this ancient decoding and all that. So maybe we could start with the transition. Well, um, my background is physics. So I'm a, my sort of PhD is theoretical physics. So I'm very grounded in science, the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and the same with um, my research at the moment is chemical physics. I teach chemical engineering. Yeah. Um, so that's got absolutely nothing to do with any of this really apart from the scientific connection <laughs> yeah exactly having 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 said that i think it probably was useful when it comes to um decoding gebekli tepe uh, i mean you know I, I like many people like many scientists um just interested in how strange the world is mm -hmm. whether it's quantum mechanics whether it's uh you know whether, whether it's hardcore physics or, or whether it's the ancient world or whatever so all these sort of mysteries of the world are, are, are in are of interest and, um, yeah, I was interested in Gebekli Tepe. 
and I read Graham Hancock's book. Um, I've, I've been following, you know, all, all sorts of literature. Yeah. On Tibetan, and I read Graham's book. Um, and I could see there that there was, uh, there was something to what he was saying about yeah, yeah. Pillar, pillar 43. So that's known as a vulture stone. And although I didn't think his explanation was quite right, I could see that already there was something, the patterns there were already pretty well matched up and it looked to be more than a coincidence. But with, with only the three patterns that he had matched to the, to the pillar, um, it could have been a coincidence. Anyway, after I investigated further, and I think the sort of my background in my research is statistical mechanics. What does that mean? That, that's, um, it means that my sort of everyday job in research is understanding the statistics of how atoms and molecules are, uh, how they can be oriented and located in space. And it's exactly the kind of training and understanding you need to, to understand or to decode the pillar, which is basically just the same kind of thing. You've got these different objects. In this case, it's the animal symbols located in different positions and different orientations. Uh, and so I could build a sort of scientific well, not entirely scientific. I could start to build a scientific case um, to try and decode that pillar. Clearly, at the end of the day, it's still um, a subject. There's a degree of subjectivity to it because mm -hmm. it's re re requiring some degree of pattern matching. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a completely scientific case, um, but uh, it was good enough for me. I, I could see how well the patterns match, so I convinced myself of the... Uh, the statistical case and, and then that led on to all sorts of other things eventually i was able to show actually this was you know, objectively um true so that that led you down the whole into the rabbit hole of gobekli tepe after after sort of looking at after reading graham hancock's book and checking out this pillar that kind of led you to trying to decode the whole the whole thing sort of not the whole thing but more of it yeah yeah basically i mean three years ago this all started three years ago um, i didn't have any not, knowledge. Well, I'd read sort of standard literature on Gebekli Tepe, yeah. so I knew a bit about it, but I had no real idea of this sort of alternative <laughs> universe. Were you, were you and, into like uh, the me megalithic stuff or ancient aliens or the pyramids or any kind of other that deeper sort of like, you know, either the astronomical aspect or the sacred geometrical well, aspect of it? Well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of familiar, yeah. familiar with some of those, some yeah. of those ideas, I'm through reading Graham Hancock's book mostly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah a few YouTube videos. So I knew about the, the Sphinx, uh, the weathering, uh, um, you know, so that was um, something I knew about. But how how it all fitted together and uh, going back beyond into prehistory, uh, my knowledge of the sort of Ice Age and the Neolithic was, was pretty sketchy. So uh, I've, had, I've done a lot of reading, a lot of learning, and uh, yeah, and quite a lot of discovering, I think. What was that process like for you? I mean, like churning through all that stuff. I mean, cause that's kind of like, you know, I kind of really, <clears throat> I've been following it most of my, you know, here and there over my life. But <clears throat> since we started the podcast, it's been like a six year sort of deep dive into a lot of stuff and it's a continuous thing. So I'm curious to see like what that process of, I guess you could almost call it an awakening was like for you. The, yeah, I mean the most sort of, um profound <laughs> moments were the actual discoveries when when you actually see oh my god this is this is true when you actually discover something new and uh, and you have this statistical case to to back you to back you up so that you you know you pretty much know that you're you're right and uh it's yeah that's 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 a sort of eureka moment that you get in you get that in science anyway you know it doesn't have to be this but this is a particularly uh, strong case of wow because it's such a such an important and such a big um breakthrough really yeah yeah so so there's those sort of discovery eureka moments and then you kind of get used to that and now it's just a case of almost every day finding something which oh that fit that fits into it as well this is sort of grand unified theory yeah, almost or yeah. prehistory yeah. and everything sort of fits together whether it's the whether it's the mythology or the um the climate or or the you know, megafauna or the or the astronomy or whatever it is it, you know it all it all ties in yeah can you do me a favor just try and slide your mic over a little bit on your on the right if you could just try and yeah slide that over a bit or it's just scratching yes. a little yeah yeah that out out yeah yeah perfect that should be good yeah right. so so uh 
So I got so many questions now. Um, maybe we should start. What do you want to do? Start summarize like the the well, the, the, uh, the premise of the book itself. Yeah, let's, that's uh, kind of that's kind of going to get into. Yeah, I think let's maybe let's start with sort of a quick gist of what we're what the what we're talking about, and then we can sort of go from there. Well, the key thing, key thing is really um, what I'm trying to address in the videos on YouTube that I've put up, which is the discovery of an ancient zodiac. Right. Um, so uh, it means that we can interpret, we can read, basically, um, lots of these old Neolithic and Paleolith Paleolithic uh, symbols that were previously just thought to be animals, maybe just um, representing hunting trips or something like this. Um, but now no, no, it's it's absolutely clear that they, they're representing um, constellations, that they are that the people of that time were, were good astronomers. They were able to, uh, well, they had good knowledge of um, precession of the equinoxes. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, yeah. what the, that's what the animal symbols are essentially encoding. It, it's a way of dating things. And a little bit more than that, they can, they can use the constellations to describe other things as well, not just dates. So they can, they can describe the passage or the, the path of the radiant of the meteor stream and, uh, and um, whether there's a meteor strike and so on. So, it, it's um, yeah. So that's the key thing: is this kind of blurring the line between prehistory and history, because we're now able to go back into areas of that that were just prehistory, and we're now able to start decoding what people were writing, essentially. So that's the key thing, and then that leads you into all sorts of things. For the starters, there's the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis and Gebekli Tepe, and that link. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you can look at the cave art and try to understand what is it that people were doing when they were drawing or painting these animal symbols. What were they trying? What message were they trying to convey? So yeah, the key thing is the ancient zodiac. We can, we can even use it to date. Um, well, that, that's probably the main use at the moment is to date ancient artifacts. And there are, I give a couple of examples in my book and a few more examples on my blog. Um, so there are lots of lots of um, artifacts that now that we can we can narrow down their dating quite often uh, ancient artifacts they're dated according to, to maybe a radiocarbon date or maybe a radiocarbon date's not possible because there's no organic content to whatever it is that they're looking at but now with if they have these symbols on them we can now date them using our zodiacal method so that's interesting because I've, I've i've inquired a couple times over the years as to what you know, obviously that previous culture wasn't probably wasn't using the same, you know, like Pisces and Leo and Cancer and they would have had their own. So have you been able to correlate those to the which ones they line up with today? Yeah, and they were. They were the crazy thing is they were using the same um, constellations, but they had different. Not all the not all of them are the same symbols. Quite a lot of them were different symbols, but it was the same constellations or at least more or less when. A good example is um, the area of the sky where we see Capricornus. They would, you know, if that was a summer solstice or a spring equinox or whatever, that they would write that as a, a bull or an aurochs symbol. So whether they were seeing the same constellation we were, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but they, they were looking at the same part of the sky anyway and interpreting that as uh, some kind of mythical bull or aurochs symbol. Uh, so yeah, I, I could I could show you um, a list if you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds fun. Okay, if I um, I'll just open up. I'll do my share the screen. And I'll open up this one. Okay, are you getting that one? Yep. All right. So here we go. I mean, we've got um, Pisces. Uh, I'm a Pisces. Yeah, so that's this sort of bending bird, and this image is taken from the top of the pillar at Gebekli Tepe. But um, we see the same image on pottery later in the Neolithic period in um, <clears throat> in the in in Mesopotamia. So, and and we see it in Egypt as well. So in Egypt, it's this this tall bird. It could be a crane or it could be an ostrich. It doesn't have to be the same species exactly, but it's it's a tall bending bird or a tall bird. I suspect. I mean, this is this is speculation, but I suspect that um, this tall bending bird eventually became the deity Thoth in ancient Egypt. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. Uh, so here we've got uh, Libra, and that's represented by the duck or goose. And we see the same symbol used in the Lasco cave, the Lasco uh, shaft scene. And uh, we also see that um, uh, Amun, one of the Egyptian deities, uh, was originally shown with um, with sort of goose feathers on his head. And then uh, that's in the Middle Kingdom. That's kind of like his symbol. Uh, and then later in the New Kingdom, Amun, uh, it was represented by the ram. That's the sort of more familiar symbol we know for Amun. And the ram is Libra. Um, I don't actually have, have that one here for us. But uh, yeah, so the ram represents Libra, as it does today. So that's one of the symbols that stays has stayed the same for as long as we can see. Oh, dear. Is it a fire? <laughs> I'm just going to have to... Pause that for a second. That's okay. Oh, okay, someone else is on today. Which one is the right, two uh, people dancing? <laughs> two Gemini, people dancing? Right? Gemini twins? Ah, right. Yeah. yeah, so Gemini in our system is um, represented by an ibex. Uh, or, I mean, sometimes it's represented by an ibex and sometimes it's represented by uh, a stag or a deer. So it depends which era and which place you're in. But um, it, from Gebekli Tepe onwards, it's mainly represented by a sort of ibex, I think. So it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be in the same orientation. It's just kind of the same same kind of shape or, or what you get out of the... Well, all of these symbols uh, are viewed at sunset. Okay. Yeah, so that that's the system that they were using. Okay, um, yeah. Not not sunrise. Um, so we for, for many of the symbols that we use, we we kind of we see them at uh, or we sort of image them at uh, sunrise. But they they weren't. They were doing it at sunset. Uh, so Virgo is is a bear. Uh, so this is a this is a picture of some kind of down crawling creature on the top of the pillar at Kabaki Tepe. But we can match that to that. Turns out, I'll just find a picture for you. But um, it turns out that that is a bear. It doesn't look like a bit much of a bear there, but um, we can then match that to other places like Chattelhoyuk, another ancient site in Turkey, and to Paleolithic cave art. And it corresponds, always Virgo corresponds to the bear. Let's see if I can find. Uh, the right slide. What's Virgo today? Is it not a bear today, is it? The Virgo is the sort of lady, isn't it? The virgin, um, the lady. Virgin, yeah. No, I can't find it here. Anyway, that's the bear. Um, let's go back. Uh, Sagittarius is the eagle or vulture. Uh, and again, we, we see that in, in different places. Um, possibly this eagle or vulture becomes Horus in ancient Egypt, but that's... Um, Bit of a guess, but uh, quite speculative. Yeah, so it, it seems that there are th these animal symbols and the constellations. That whole system was more or less fixed, more or less constant, apart from one or two changes here and there. Um, so, for instance, um, there are in in the in the, um, in the cave art, Paleolithic cave art, uh, Libra is sometimes represented by the mammoth. Or the, I, think, I guess it's the mammoth rather than an elephant, uh, and sometimes by the duck or the goose. But pretty much it's fixed until we get to the Bronze Age. And, and, and then it seems that the Mesopotamians, they made all sorts of changes. And that's where we get our constellations from. That's our constellation set. It's from the Mesopotamians. Uh, and they made the all sorts of changes. When's the Bronze Age? Oh, right. So that'll be about 3000 BC onwards. I see. So this would have been, yeah. uh, they would have been using the same symbols for a while after the end of the Ice Age, after the Younger Dryas. Yep. They were still using the ancient symbology for 10,000 years or so? Yeah, as far as we can tell um, at the moment, this goes all the way back to 40,000 BC. Uh, probably. That's not, that's, um, like that's likely to be the case 40,000 BC it could go back further than that but yeah it pretty much the same symbols all um, coming forward until like i say about 3000 BC in Mesopotamia and then the um Sumerians or the Babylonians start making changes so they they change Gemini to the twins for instance um 
yeah. the, the ones that we're familiar with. But yeah, until then, it's pretty much fixed. Such a long, long time. It seems that um, it, it was more or less static until writing came along. And I think that makes a massive difference. Once you start having writing, um, you know, you, the, the sort of the elites lose control of the knowledge, if you like. Uh, and it becomes more of a, a democratic thing. Uh, and so other people can start uh, getting involved. And I, that's when there, there's this, there are these changes. With the, uh, what was that, the first, the, like the Emerald Tablets? The, was that the first writing? Oh, I don't know about that. I, think, uh, the like, first... I thought it was around like around that. Or maybe it was I mean, yeah. So in Mesopotamia, don't I think the first writing. Don't write. Yeah. yeah, in Mesopotamia, the first writing you know, occurs about uh, three, just before 3000 BC. They they have these these clay tablets that they write their their cuneiform yeah. script, on. and it's pretty similar in ancient Egypt. The same, more or less, the same time, but a, a different script, a different language, obviously. Um, yeah. So how does this correlate? Like, how does this um, ancient zodiac correlate to the younger Dryas then, and and what happened at Gobekli Tepe before the end of the Ice Age? So, um, so Gebeki Tepe, are you still seeing my yep, screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, wow, so Gebeki Tepe pretty, is, that's pretty detailed, eh? Yeah, is using the same system, um, as far as we can see, that has been used for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so that's the one I've just just shown you. Uh, so here we have pillar forty three or the Vulture Stone, uh, which is giving us the date. So it's using precession of the equinoxes to encode a date. So here we've got Sagittarius at the summer solstice. We've got Pisces, I think that's the autumn equinox, Gemini at the um, winter solstice, and uh, Virgo at the spring equinox. And so these these handbags are actually, well, we're pretty certain they are actually um, seasons? sunsets. Sunsets, sunsets yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the equinoxes and the solstices. Oh, that they, I see. Uh, so the so sunset at small. those relevant when the sun changes when it when it's either yeah. from its equal space or it's at its lower highest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so have yeah. you seen yeah. any? Because I mean, a bunch of those ancient paintings have people carrying that handbag around. I wonder if that correlates somehow. That handbag looks just like that one too. From where? Yeah, I know that, or? Like the ones that people are always carrying in the old, like. Uh, even like I think it's what's in his South, name South Africa as well. I think yeah, or South America. South America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, I know what you mean. That there are these there are these ideas about the handbags and how they they might be the same symbol. I, I suspect you know, it it could be true that they are the same symbol and they might be related to these handbags, but uh, it's difficult to to know because the the distances and the times are so far apart that it, it's hard to see any kind of a causal trail between them so they might just be completely coincidental mm -hmm. um, i mean the, i think the the sort of traditional view of those handbags is that they are just some kind of priests um maybe like a, a water bucket or something with holy water and they're sprinkling the holy water which is which absolutely could be the case that could be what how they were used at that time but they, their symbology might have a much older and uh sort of um line to it so it's possible that it could be related to these but um that's a very tenuous tenuous connection i think at the moment anyway so where's the fourth sunset then right so you've got the summer one here oh bottom, okay so. okay it's at the bottom yeah, yeah right okay yeah and then there's those three so that's um that's that pillar and then you've got uh, well there are lots of other pillars like the tepe so this one pillar two from enclosure a uh, so we've got the aurochs, the fox, and uh, the, the, the tall bird. So that's Capricornus, Aqu Northern Aquarius, and uh, Pisces. In fact, I think I've got a, an image where I, sh I compare them next to the um, constellations. Let's see if I can. Here we go. Right, there you go. So again, there's a, there's a pretty good match. We, this is the Pisces one. Uh, this is the northern part of Aquarius, which looks like the fox. And Capricornus looks a bit like the aurochs. And you could say, well, maybe, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, you know, it's just a bit of uh, that's very um, subjective. And at this stage, it is that that is quite subjective. But the thing is that when it we've we've essentially scientifically proven 
that the animal symbols are constellations, not through Gebekli Tepe, but through our analysis of the cave art. So what we were able to do with the cave art is to compare. <clears throat> so what people were doing in in the caves, it seems, is that you know, when when the summer solstice was Capricornus, they would paint a bull. And when the summer solstice uh, was, <clears throat> um, let's say, Leo, they would paint a horse and so on. So we're able to compare the dates, the radiocarbon dates of those cave paintings with the zodiacal dates from our from procession of the equinoxes and our zodiac. And they match up perfectly in, huh. in, 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 in practically every case. So statistically, in a scientific sense, we've proven that the, the animal symbols are constellations. Uh, and it's the same animal symbols here. So, you know, we can, again, we can say, look, these are constellations. And when you, when you match them, you know, when you ask, well, what constellations could these be? This is, um, this is what you find. So, um, so what does this mean? Well, these, these three constellations here, that's the the path of the torrid meteor stream at that time. So you know, Gebe Gebeki Tepe is yeah. So Gebeki Tepe is is all connected with the Younger Dryas event, according to our interpretation. So is that and, like the uh, sequence that those constellations follow in the sky? Absolutely, quite right. Yeah, I'll just show you another one. Uh, Here we go. <clears throat> there we go right so um yeah so at the time that gebeki tepe was occupied around 10,000 bc the torrid meteor stream would be you, you'd see it emanate from a particular particular direction in the sky and that would have been at the time capricornus uh then golden aquarius and then pisces that's the path it would have taken over. Over the course of about a month, the, the radiant would move in that direction, uh, and which is exactly what we see on this pillar. Or at least we can we can match that to these um, symbols on the pillar, yeah. which we know, which we know are constellations. So yeah, so that that could either be them just writing down the path, or it may be that this is actually the name. Maybe this is they called. It's possible that they called. Um, this tor the torrid meter stream by this name, if you like, these three symbols represented it. That's a possibility. And the reason I say that is because these pillars are so similar to the... Um, uh, the k -word? Hang on. No, not the k <laughs> um, I'm probably going a bit quickly. I need to now find another slide. Uh, I don't know that I've got it here. Oh, well. Right, anyway, these um, these pillars are so similar to the, the the hieroglyphics that we see. So that the Egyptians had a way of writing names with hieroglyphics. They would have symbols inside, like a curved boundary with a horizontal line at one end, and it looks just exactly just like um, one of these pillars. So I'm trying to. I, I suspect there are lots of these kind of links between Gebekli Tepe and ancient Egypt. What about uh, ancient Mesopotamia, or uh, sorry, South America? Yeah, well... Have you got to go in, digging into there at all yet? I haven't really, no. Um, that's, uh, again, it's, it's, that's a, a very different part of the world, a different mythology. Um, so I haven't really looked at the symbols there. But I suspect it's probably true, because it, this system goes back possibly 40,000 years. Which means there was plenty of time for this zodiac, this system, to have dispersed across the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, with the uh, Americas supposedly populated around, I don't know, fifteen thousand years ago. So yeah, at that time, it, it gives it gives it gives plenty of time anyway for this knowledge to have percolated into to the Americas, even in the conventional model. I'll give you an example that I came across just the other day. <clears throat> so, the, uh, in, in, in Central and, and South America, I think it was the, they had these um, Puma Warriors, is that, is that the right? Cougar Warriors? Puma Warriors. Yeah, so they, the, <clears throat> the, the Puma uh, symbol was very popular. It was like one of the most prominent symbols 
from about um i think it's about 1200 bc up to about 0 ad so you know a stretch of a, of a thousand years or more now it just happens at that time that um the uh, constellation cancer is the summer solstice and in our zodiac cancer is represented by um the feline the cat large the large cat so it's possible that these um, these puma warriors or this this puma symbolism is again it's all just reflecting this system where in our case um cancer is is the constellation corresponding to uh, the feline <laughs> But I haven't looked at it closely. So that's just one example. That could be coincidence. So it really does seem like it was, <clears throat> as far as Gobekli Tepe is concerned, and that it was almost an, they were following <clears throat> this almost as a, as a warning system. Like if they're tracking the Torids and they know that in the past, like before the Younger Dryas, there was that other event. So did they know, like, was this thing covered up between events or did they know that the, you know, like the Torrid during that time, the earth was bombarded, <clears throat> let's say, and then they end up, they, you know, they know when that happened due to their calendars and their, cause they're following all this stuff. They're following the, you know, the sun and the moon and, in all their structures. Yeah. So they know when this stuff is happening and then they're, and then they, they see the Torrid coming around again, maybe. And that's when they, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it seems like the skeptical argument of just this being, you know, like they, you know, you, you probably caused quite a bit of a stir with, you know, your scientific background. I mean, I read some of the, and they just, you know, I don't know, maybe it feels like you're stepping on archaeologist toes or something like that when you're, when you're decoding all this stuff, but they, they don't seem to take into account that all across the globe, they were following the sun and the moon and they had uh, all these alignments in their megalithic structures. So obviously they knew they were following stuff and they knew what was happening. And it seems to be relevant that what you're pointing out here is that they're following these, uh, these streams that could have just, you know, caused the younger Dryas, And that's why they covered the stuff up before it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the sort of conventional view is that astronomy just wasn't practiced by ancient people before, let's say that, middle of Mesopotamian time, so in the middle of the Bronze Age, around two or 3,000 BC. So before then, the general view amongst academic archaeologists is that astronomy, that's when astronomy started. So all of this stuff that you just said about alignments of, of temples and, and what have you, that's just not taken... Um, Serious? We, 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 we kind of know that this is correct, right? But yeah, your, 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 your standard academic archaeologist won't accept that. Really? Say, yeah, oh, they, still, they still don't yeah. accept that stuff? Because that, that's what surprised well, me about well, reading well, some of the skeptical responses. Like, well, you guys should know by now yeah. that there's, it's not just a coincidence that the moon lines up uh, on its, uh, ma on its uh, lunar maximum in between these two things. And from, from a view yeah. from the temple, I mean, it, that, that's not just coincidence. Probably, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say all all of these sort of yeah, academic yeah, yeah. archaeologists. But, but the, it's, the mainstream, it's, yeah. The yeah. Ones, I'm not, yes, I mean, e I'm not even sure if it's exactly the mainstream, but certainly the ones that I have been in contact with yeah. are, are, are typically the ones that object to this. So maybe they're a fringe in the archaeology community. I don't know. Well, they're, allowed, they're, they're, allowed, they're a loud one. I mean, we're, they we're are, still, they living, we're still living in the paradigm where this, you know... <laughs> This, yeah. Any kind of ancient uh, alternative history theories are pretty much ignored or ridiculed. So, yeah, that's right. So, let's say it's very contentious anyway that there is this idea that astronomy could have been studied before the Bronze Age. Of course, we we know that, and, and we've we've now I've now proven uh, with this um, correlation between animal symbols and um, you know, the constellations that. That's absolutely true. So all, all of the all of this um, speculation, I say all this, all of the studies were, which were looking at the orientation even of the the ancient caves. So lots of these caves systems, they they are also pointing either directly south or directly at the um, the sunrise on the equinox or whatever it is. So that they are also have the the solar alignments going way way back. So it's very clear that there was this astronomical tradition, um, but it turns out they knew a, a lot more than we have given them credit for. But that's not accepted at the moment. So what's this graph that you have up there on the screen now then? 
Yeah. Okay. I know that. Thank you for reminding me. So you were saying uh, <laughs> that uh, the world was being bombarded and uh, there are all these climate shifts. So this is just really showing us that, yeah, I mean, this is the younger driest period and this is where the, the temperature drops by you know, over 10 degrees right at the start. And uh, there are papers that show that this, this temperature drop happens within a space of a year. Uh, this is from analyzing um, ice cores from Greenland. They can see yeah. that this happens within a year, not the whole of this temperature range, but the, the, it's when the, this temperature starts to drop. Um, uh, it happens really quickly within a year. And there's no way that, as far as I understand it, that that can be re reproduced by any climate model without some kind of catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's that's another piece of the evidence that this happened. <clears throat> and then you can you can see that there are these massive fluctuations in temperature. So the, the thick black line here is uh, the um, temperature record from the Greenland ice core. So that's like a, a proxy for northern hemisphere temperature. And the thin line here is temperature from the Antarctica. Uh, ice, man, ice we got to get Antarctica. That's got to get down to Argentina, man. You know, that's why the <laughs> Nazis were going to Argentina, because when shit hits the fan, it's not so bad. It's got to be because of all the water, right? Yeah, well, that that I mean, what you what you're saying is actually an, you know it's an important thing because um, what it shows is that in the southern hemisphere the, the climate is much more stable than in the northern hemisphere over over the ice age. This is this is wow, going back. Yeah, 40, yeah. we yeah, gotta yeah. get out of here, man. This is going back forty thousand years, and I talk about this in my book. There's there's a reason why the the climate in the southern hemisphere is much more stable than the northern hemisphere. Uh, it's quite quite a technical reason, but like. You know, you can see these dramatic fluctuations and, and the, the sort of general view among climate scientists is that these are all a, a natural part of Earth's climate. With the soil, is it related to the solar cycles or? Not sure. Um, yeah. well, I, I don't know how they explain it. Well, I, I kind of understand the mechanism, but not what initiates the mechanism, what, what kind of prompts this, this switch to happen. And I think it's not really something that's, that's known very well. In, uh, it's not understood in the climate community as to what is actually driving. They, they can see in their models that there is this sort of two-state system where the, in the northern hemisphere, the temperature can either be high or low. And this, the high point corresponds to um, an interglacial period when the, when the ice has receded and the low point corresponds to a glacial period when the, the, the ice has come all the way down, well, part of the way down through, across the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so this is ice. This is all basically, this is tracking the ice covering in the Northern Hemisphere. So for all the people listening on audio, we're looking at this graph and it goes back to 40,000 years and there's 10 to 15 degree swings in the Northern Hemisphere within, yeah. within a few hundred to a thousand years. It's just massive swings. Whereas the Southern Hemisphere is just sort of along, you know, maybe there's a three to five degree swing and it's way less of a, of a variance there. And then you hit the younger Dryas and then it, they That's both right. go, they both steady out after that big, that big shift. The uh, south about, one about seems 12, pretty steady. About years ago. No, but it goes up to the zero. Like, like what's the zero? That's the temperature difference. So, so it, it kind of moves yeah. into that, you know, that uh, stable, stable environment. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, doesn't it, doesn't this put a little bit of perspective on today's hysteria over global warming and that what, what we're causing when you look at these massive shifts back then? It does a little bit in the sense that, yeah. I mean, that that shit can happen that, without yeah. our, out of our control, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, but the, the difference is, I think, even by today's, you know, the, the, the temperature change, the rate at which temperature are changing today is, is extremely quick. So it's as, it's as quick as some of these much older events, but um, it's being caused according to the, the well, how, theory. How can, how can it be that quick? If it, if it hasn't really gone up that much and we might be moving into an ice age, how, how can it be as quick as it was back then? Well, those spikes are over probably a hundred years, right? Or 200 years. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So there's, they have a width to them. Yeah, so but they're right. huge, so but is, they're huge spikes. I mean, we yeah, have, they are, you know, they are huge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, you can't really compare today's climate change to the to the ancient changes. Now, the thing is, these I can show you another picture. These mm -hmm. um, this is from a, a paper 
couple of years ago, which shows how megafaunal extinctions yeah. appear to correlate with these um, temperature changes. So again, this is the, I think this oh, is the a good graph. northern hemisphere uh, temperature changes from a ice core. And you can see how the, the, these silhouettes here, they are the positions or the, the times of extinction events, main, mainly extinction events, yeah. And you can see they correlate pretty well with these dramatic fluctuations in, in climate. And the same with this, this, this sort of cluster of extinctions around the Younger Dryas period. Again, they correlate pretty well with these fluctuations in climate. Well, so especially it's, it's, that other one. That's pretty clear. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Is this other one, is that's the megafauna from 30,000 years ago that went extinct? Yeah, the middle, the middle part. And then the one to the left is more yeah, at the Younger right. Dryas there, yeah. So they can't blame any of those right. that were in North America <laughs> on <not> people. <laughs> or they have to give up, they got to give us some ground someplace. Oh, actually, that's a good point, though. Is that what you get into in your book? Is like, how can you blame yeah. the people for overhunting if that whole section went extinct in the middle of the Ice Age? Yeah, basically, yeah. There's, there are a lot of extinctions, it's thought, around this time. And the evidence that they were caused by by human overhunting is is not there. So right, right. in this paper, in this paper, they they correlate them with climate change. Right. Yeah. yeah. Problem, and, that, and that's that. I kind of agree with that. I'm pretty sure that dramatic changes in climate will have a, a massive effect on, um, you know, the animals and whether they can find the food and, and and how quickly they can migrate to get to new sources of food and so on. But I, but if you I discuss this in the book. If you think about um, South America, got another picture, I think. South America, just that the climate in South America is pretty stable at this time. And yet there are the, the megafauna in South America, uh, well, we, we've lost just as much megafauna in South America as North America. So climate can't be the only factor here. Uh, climate doesn't explain everything. It probably explains part of it but it doesn't explain everything oh, it's the and, same with overhunting yeah right Lack so it's, and it's not just overhunting mm -hmm. and climate you're i think what you're getting to is you're hinting at something catastrophic that's right so there that the evidence suggests that there is another cause and it might even be a dominant cause of these megafaunal extinctions and therefore also perhaps these these climate switches is that they're driven by something else like like you say some kind of comet impact uh, so i go into that in the book and uh so do you it's think not, obviously that's it, do you think all those yeah. crazy spikes before now are those just all impacts? Well, okay, so this is oh that's interesting. This is now or like even the other one you had after that. You had uh, yeah. the one was showing the megafauna. The one that was showing right up to present, where it really came out. Yeah, the one that was showing the megafauna extinction. The, the megafauna, right here we go. Yeah. So on the bottom of that, there's all those like right. You got the on the left there. That's now, and then that's now, so yeah. starting like twelve well, thousand years ago, it's a shit show for like thirty <laughs> or forty or fifty thousand years. Yeah, basically, that's the idea. Is that at the moment the uh, that one of the leading theories is that these megafaunal extinctions are caused by these uh, climate switches, but that doesn't explain South America. Right. So what I'm saying is that. Well, maybe it's not just climate. Maybe, maybe, and in fact, maybe it's um, comet impacts, which is causing these climate shifts, as we kind of almost know now with the Younger Dryas. With, with, and, 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 and it could be like, so what you're saying is it could be a, a regular cycle of the torrid, let's say, that causes those spikes. And then something happened at the end of the Younger Dryas when it's almost like we, we reached the pinnacle of those impacts and then it's sort of steadied out or something. Exactly. That's that's the point I'm making. Now, the science of the Younger Dryas period is, is pretty good. We, there's a lot of evidence that it happened, and yeah. we know how sudden it was. Right. These these this time back here. This apart from the, the climate's known very well, but the extinctions and their accuracy. Uh, this isn't. This is a bit more vague, simply because of the, the the time depth is much longer. So, so what I'm suggesting is it, it's possible. It's it's a it's a maybe that, that these were caused also by. Um, comet impacts and the reason for suspecting that that might be true is that the um the sort of the theory the astronomical theory for the younger dryas impact is based as you've just said on the torrids well 
the theory behind the Taurids is that there was this giant comet that entered the inner solar system. And it, it would have taken tens of thousands of years to, to break up and fragment. Ah. So, so we wouldn't, you know, supposing that that's true, and I think the evidence is extremely strong that it's true, we wouldn't expect just one event like this. We would expect multiple events like this over the last 20, 30, 40,000 years. So, yeah, it, it could be that these are being driven by other um, comet impacts, just like the Younger Dryas. Right. And then you, so you sort of, you can picture it going through, like we enter through that stream until eventually there's nothing left because you've gone through it or you've gone through the major parts of it. And now we're back to the, you know, to the end of it kind of like the, where it's more dispersed. Does that make sense, Darren? That's right. Or smaller. Yeah, that's right. Or so, smaller. Yeah. So this, like, yeah. Exactly. So it, the, the comet breaks up, it fragments, it turns gradually into dust. And I'll just show you another slide. And that process can take tens of thousands of years. Yeah. So this is the zodiacal dust cloud <clears throat> that we observe today. So this dust is essentially the dust from an ancient comet. Probably most of this dust is from one comet, probably this giant comet that entered the inner solar system. And yeah, so knowing the size of this comet, this is like a... Um, a lower bound to the size of the comet. It was probably over 100 kilometers in diameter. And based on that estimated size of this comet, uh, we can kind of estimate the number of fragments that it would have produced. And that then tells us that we should expect, I'll just wind forward, that's Comet Enki. We should expect about 10 impacts over the last, say, 30 to 40,000 years. Uh, about 10 oh. impacts with, with comets equivalent to a half a kilometer in size. And we can expect one impact with the fragments that are about a kilometer in size. So probably the Younger Dryas event was that really bad one. Uh, and the, perhaps, and then the, these other ones further back in the, the Ice Age, they might have been these other, I mean, 10 is an approximation, you know, it's like a, an estimate. But we, we can expect that there would have been many other um, they could have caused the ice events. age, right? Because what we're saying, the last ice age started uh, thirty six thousand years ago or something. I mean, when you start looking at those numbers, they all seem to cycle into procession somehow or another. Yeah, well, okay. Starting the ice age, I don't know. I mean, the, the ice age started a hundred thousand years. Yeah, I mean, it's oh, been a it long, long cycle, ago? but no. well, it's been a long, long cycle. Even past I thought that, like I mean, thirty nine thousand years ago or something. It was like kind of not so bad. There was this period in the middle, I don't think I've got a figure for this, but um, there was a period in the middle of the last ice age when uh, things kind of warmed up a bit, almost like an interglacial, but then we went back into the ice age. I don't know if it's here in that picture. Yeah, I think it's this, this kind of region here where it was almost like an interglacial period. Oh, and that's and, what you're uh, talking about, Darren, yeah. And, uh, so I'm, I would suggest that maybe all this stuff from about 40,000 years onwards, that might be the effect of this giant comet. So this giant comet maybe entered our inner solar system, you know, 40 to 50,000 years ago, started to break up, caused lots of extinction events and climate change, uh, rapid climate change. And then there was this massive one, the Younger Dryas. And now, like you say, it's fragmented and turned to dust so much, uh, all that's left pretty much is this zodiacal dust cloud. Plus, there are still a few fragments, but there's not so many and they're not so large and they're not really a risk to us anymore. And that's where we are now in the Holocene period. This last 10,000 years. <clears throat> are, we, are we going through this? We're going through that right now or no? Uh, no, we're not going through the, the dense part of this torrid meteor stream. Uh, according to the astro. According to the astronomers, um, we're due to go through the, the dense part of it. Supposedly, it, it kind of correlates. They, they think the densest part of this is like a filament. It correlates with the orbit of Comet Enki, uh, they think. And we're due to kind of intersect that in about 3000 AD, so in about 1000 years. So we've got a while yet. <clears throat> Don't we go through the Taurids twice a year, though? Yeah, we do. Um, so the way to think about the Taurids is, um, yeah, it's like this great big revolving, actually, I've got another slide, the best way to show it. <laughs> Let's 
Yeah, let's go to well, and I I'm, thought once was right to, now. Are you trying to piece it together also as part like, of the great year as well? Like how to like? Yeah, I think it fits in somehow. to procession would I'd imagine procession would would play a role. But I'm just thinking right. right right now. I'm thinking about like I think we go through the torrids in like a couple of weeks. And these That's days, right. I'm always a little nervous about going through the torrids. <laughs> <laughs> So if you think about, um, if this is the Earth's orbit, which is circular more or less, so we're looking at it from the side on here, and then you've got Comet Enki and the Taurids, they orbit more or less on the surface of this, of a, a plane, which is inclined to our orbit. Now, there are like two types of... Perspective- almost. Well, that's what I've drawn it here, but actually it's not, it's... Um, this is going to exaggerate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an exaggerated picture. So the, the the torrid meter stream or comet Enki anyway is inclined at about twelve percent. Here it's about forty five, uh, sorry degrees. Yeah, I see. So there's uh, a ton so anyway, of moving parts there. So I mean, when the maximum yeah. hits the maximum, ooh, That's look right. out! That's right. So now that the torrid meter stream is so old, twenty, thirty, forty thousand years. But it's become really broad. And so the bulk of it kind of, or large parts of it move around like a donut shape. But within that donut shape, there are these um, elliptical filaments. Uh, uh, So that's this kind of orbit here. So I'm kind of describing Enki's orbit here in a very sort of approximate schematic way. And you can see that when you have this apsidal precession, which happens within this plane, so the orbit stays sort of fixed within this plane, but it can rotate around the sun. And you can see that at some point in the future, um, Enki, which we think is kind of at the heart of the torrids, the sort of dense part of the torrids, that's going to intersect Earth's orbit down here twice uh, on this side. And then as it rotates all the way around, it's going to intercept twice over here as well. And that whole process takes 6,000 years. So basically there are two high-risk periods separated by about 3,000 years. There a high risk period on this side, and then three thousand years later, a high risk period on this side. And the next one's in nine hundred so years. Sorry, and then the next high risk is in around yes. nine hundred years or so. That's that's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now there's another kind of procession which maybe we don't need to talk talk about, but it's called longitudinal procession, and it's that that's where this um, plane in which the orbits are processing the whole plane rotates around the sun so you can imagine this angle this angle here is increasing that's longitudinal procession and it's that procession that causes the the radiant the position of the radiant of the torrids in the sky to move along the zodiac so that's how we could um, work out how the torrids would have looked at the time of Gebekli Tepe because of the longitudinal procession but anyway the um the kind of catastrophic ages that you were talking about, that's the apsidal procession every 3,000 years. And that kind of correlates with these, the, the, there are the many myths have these ages of darkness and then uh, there are these, you know, recovery and, and so on. So you've got that all over the world, these um, these catastrophic myths. It's fascinating. I wonder if that 3,000 matches those spikes you were looking at, Darren, in the, you know, in the, in the ice age, right? Every, uh-huh. Yeah. So, so I, at least it's comforting to look like we're through the worst of it because shit wasn't too bad 3,000 years ago. Or was that when, no, Tunguska was only a few hundred years ago, not even. Yeah, years ago. so that's the thing, you see, is that although the densest uh, part, the core of the torrid meter stream, the high risk part is every, say, 3,000 years, that doesn't mean to say there's no risk at other times. Yeah, there could be a whole so, other system coming through at some point. Yeah, uh, and different parts of it will be processing at different rates. So you, that's why you'll still get things like the Tunguska event a uh, hundred years ago. Um, but still, that was probably still part of the torrid meter stream, but a slightly different um, sort of filament or a different um, substream of the main complex. So the risk is always there. It's just maximum at, or maximal every 3,000 years. And for how long? So is that like maximum last 10 years or 50 years yeah i'm not entirely sure but i i from from what i read in the um 
so the, the real experts on this are the astronomers, um, Victor Klub and, and Bill Napier and their colleagues. And from what I read in their papers, they, they say this period of risk is about, is a couple of hundred years, maybe 500 years. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. Um, 500 years? I, Every yeah. 3,000 years? Yeah. So that means yeah, like risk, you're like, in it like 18% of the time. Yeah, this, risk. Is, this is. This is I, that's right. Well, we got a couple hundred years. Fucking party. Yeah, we should, we should be good for a few years yet, I think. Well, I'm just trying to look for unless a, the sun plot. Unless the sun fucks us up. I mean, if that goes into like solar minimum, if it continues, then we might be, you know, might not matter what's flying around in the sky if there's no, no heat. Yeah, so if you look at, going back to this fire. picture, it's probably the clearest one. So if you look over the Holocene period, so that's the last 10,000 years, there have also been lots of fluctuations, much smaller. But so for this, this event here, mm -hmm. this is known as the, the 8.2 kilo year event uh, by climatologists. And it turns out that that was exactly when we were passing through uh, that's that's one of these epi episodes when we are passing through the younger dryas. Uh, sorry, through the, the torrid. Yeah. The torrid. Beach. Wow. Yeah, right there. It's the biggest one in the whole Holocene. We so correlates with yeah, the passage that, through the torrid. Oh, that is interesting. I wonder yeah. if there's any. Is there any, getting, is there any evidence of uh, impact uh, in on the Earth at that time? People well, haven't really looked. I don't yeah, think. Yeah. Um, but it's something I discuss in my book, and I suspect. I suspect that, um, well, let, let's think about the, the, you know, you know that the controversy surrounding the Sphinx and the dating of the Sphinx and Robert Shock's weathering. Yep. And uh, so there's, there's a theory, you know, I think it's Graham Hancock's theory or maybe Robert Bavall, I'm not sure. But they date, they, they think that the Sphinx is representing Leo. Yeah. And that would therefore put the date of the Sphinx in around, in around here, sort of yeah. 10,000 well, 12,000 BP, so that's 10,000 BC. Now, it turns out there is no evidence that um, feline shapes represented Leo at this time. All the evidence points to giant feline shapes or large, large felines cancer. representing the constellation Cancer. Yeah. Now, Cancer is the summer solstice in this period. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. So I suspect that if there was this ancient Egyptian lost civilization, and I think probably there was, because I, I kind of agree that the, the Sphinx probably is much, much older. I think all the evidence is pointing to a much, much older Sphinx than conventionally thought. So I suspect that the, the Sphinx is actually was built here, mm -hmm. and it was the eight, and it was the eight point two kilo event oh. that okay. led to the end of this ancient Egyptian civilization. So the Sphinx was just before that or after that? I suspect the Sphinx was just yeah, before yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's 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 the era when Cancer is a spring equinox. So that's when they would have been having all these, and we see the same symbols at Chattel Hoyak. I've mentioned that before. Chattel Hoyak was uh, one of the world's first towns. It had a population of say between five and ten thousand people in in Turkey, southern Turkey, and not too far from Gebekli Tepe actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and at Chattel Hoyak at this time, you see leopard shrines. So at Chattel Hoyak, they've got leopard shrines, and I suspect at the same time, they were building the Sphinx in Egypt along the Nile. But then, boom, there's this 8.2 kilo year event. Chattel Hoyak comes to an end, and it pretty much does. It's the sort of beginning of the end of Chattel Hoyak. After that, it kind of disappears over to the next few hundred years. And, of course, I think you've got the end of um, this ancient Egyptian civilization. Now, the thing is, there is no evidence at all of any kind of um, population, any kind of um, uh, people during this period along the Nile in ancient Egypt. It's like it's a complete blank. It's like a black hole. Apparently, there was no one out. there. They there's, were wiped they were still, out. They were still in Atlantis then. They were moving over from Atlantis. <laughs> they were swimming back up and getting <laughs> washed out. <clears throat> I mean, the interesting thing about that is like, for all intents and purposes, the world's 12,000 years old, because before that it was a total shit show. For a hundred or thousand years. Well, not or the so whole world, though. I mean, you know, the, I, the, the whole world wasn't encased in ice. I mean, the northern hemisphere was way worse. Yeah, but, but if all those are hemisphere. impacts, then it, the, the megafauna in the south is dying, too. 
Yeah, I see. The thing is, I mean, the, the Younger Dryas event here was experienced really badly, obviously, by North America, and it seems perhaps South America as well, and parts of Europe. But that's, like I say, that's not the whole world. However, you know, if you've got this fragmenting comet, all these other events, they're not all, they're not, not all of these comet fragments are going to impact the Northern Hemisphere. Right. In fact, most of them, most of them are going to impact into the Pacific Ocean. That's the largest expanse that we yeah, know that's of. Good point. Yeah, that's a, a large percentage so, of the Earth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's about a third of the surface of the Earth is the yeah. Pacific Ocean. So we can expect several of these events to have taken place in the Pacific. So then that makes you think. Well, you know, there are there are these um, enigmatic uh, features that um, Graham Hancock's talked about quite a lot in his books. Could it be some? Could they? Could these events in the Pacific be something to do with that? I think it's quite likely that there were civilizations. You see, that the, the current view is that the Pacific Island civilizations go back to about three, go back about three thousand years, maybe a little bit more. Um, and before that, that there were no people in these Pacific Islands; they were uninhabited, more or less. I suspect that there were other civilizations in the Pacific, but they got wiped out. And, and it's you know if if you if you if you accept this model of this giant comet causing the younger Dryas impact and possibly other lots of other impacts as well, then it then it, it kind of logically follows that the Pacific would have been the riskiest place on Earth to live, because if if you get one of these impacts into the ocean, then it's going to create a, a tsunami, a mega tsunami, and that would probably spread out across the whole ocean. So if you get an impact anywhere in the ocean, Pacific Ocean. You know, no, pr- practically nowhere is safe. Yeah, yeah. On the you know around the edges of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. So, d- geez, do you um, do you think there's do you, have you come across Atlantis and all that in in this like so talking about that? I mean, I've heard rumors of what do you think, Darren, about being in the you know in the Azores or something or in other areas that that maybe. Well, it makes me think more about talking to Dave Matheson and about how he thinks the Bible is all like encoded, uh, encoded M- uh, astro theology, and it's all to do with, and you know, it just makes me think that that was like a continuation of following these stars and tracking these stars because they fuck you up every couple thousand years, and it just all got sort of hijacked. Absolutely, and that's again, I, I think that's completely right. It's something I discuss in, in prehistory decoded. You have all these myths uh, from all and religions from all around the world, including current day religions that have this uh, cycle of catastrophes in them. Christianity is no different. And uh, the, that um, if you read, there's a, there's a great book on the origins of mythology by uh, Michael Witzel. So he's a, a Harvard professor of Sanskrit, but he, he, he likes his mythology as well. <laughs> and he, he can he can see that. Um, uh, according to his view, anyway, that all of these um, all of these mythologies, these catastrophic mythologies, they go back to about forty thousand years. What's the no book further. called again? What's the book called again? So his book is Origins of the World's Mythologies. Oh, okay, okay. So, so again, his his time scale of forty thousand years it fits really well with this view that there was a giant comet that came into the inner solar system about thirty to forty thousand years ago. You, I think you really like. Uh, just, we, we've had a, a guest on quite a bit of on the star myth. David Matheson, Darren was just mentioning him. He's got a couple really big books uh, describing all the different myths in the world and how they can correspond to the same constellation uh, throughout. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, he's got a couple encyclopedias. Now yeah. Now you mentioned Atlantis. Now I, I suspect Atlantis. Well, I, I suspect that's probably just Plato's invention. So I'm kind of conventional on that. I don't think there was a, an advanced civilization that lived on an island known as Atlantis. I suspect it's probably some kind of generalized flood myth that that could be the case. Yeah, and um, a lot of people think it's, it's not, not just a one one like island, but it's just the whole global culture at that point was called Atlantis. You know, <clears throat> it was that that whole well, advanced global culture. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. So and and I. As far as I know, there isn't any, it, it's only Plato that talks about Atlantis. I don't know that there are any other, before Plato, I don't know that there's any other record. The Phaethon myth, though, so that's 
rather than a flood, the Phaethon myth is a great fire, a conflagration. That is well attested from several sources. So it, it seems that this Phaethon myth was was in sort of wide circulation. Um, so I suspect that is kind of a more direct um, vision, if you like, or rec record of something you know, that happened. And that, that could actually go all the way back to maybe this younger Dryas impact, the mm -hmm. Phaethon myth. So do you feel like the, the mainstream is starting to move towards the catastrophism as opposed to the gradualistic theories on, on stuff? I think, um, I think it's, it's clear now that um, catastrophism is, is correct. I think, I think most scientists, maybe nearly, nearly all scientists, would be cat catastrophists of some sort. The difference between, I guess, from my position and most other scientists would be how recently catastrophes have occurred. So I think that the general view is that, yeah, they can occur on the time scale of millions of years. So, um, you know, we, we kind of accept. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we accept the dinosaurs and there may have been a few other things like that, but nothing recently and cer certainly nothing that would have affected humans. So that's the last, you know, 10,000 years for civilization or maybe 100,000 years for our sort of development and, and so on. But so what we're saying, and I think the catastrophists, sort of, you know, the sort of classical catastrophists would say, yeah, it's, it's affected mankind and pretty badly, and especially the last 30 to 40,000 years, which is where we get all this catastrophic myth. And again, the, the usual view, I guess, of academics is that, uh, well, it's just such a low probability event. You know, this, this can't have happened so recently. But the thing is, those people, they don't know about this, this theory of a giant comet. Uh, which it goes by the name of coherent catastrophism, this theory. So they, don't, they either don't know, or if they know about it, they don't accept this theory of a giant comet. But the, the evidence for this, this giant comet is really, really strong. Uh, it's almost certain that it was part of our cosmic environment over the last 30 to 40,000 uh, years. So I think eventually, you know, with, with all of this evidence mounting up, eventually science will come to accept catastrophism on the time scale of human civilization, the time scale of what we've be, where we've been recording myths and creating myths, um, but we're not there yet. I think there's only a few of us that are have dared to go down that path. I think the Comet Research Group is getting ready to drop a lot of stuff with these new Norway or uh, Greenland impact sites and stuff like that. I think, I mean, at least the younger, driest one seems like it's getting close. Yeah, I think... Um, I'm interested to what they're going to teach my kids. <laughs> they're a couple of years away from starting to learn that. I, th I think people are wavering. I think if, if you'd asked that, say, five years ago, I think it still would have been pretty much negative. I think the... Uh, I, I, I don't really know, but I, I suspect these days that it's a much more... Uh, people are much more willing to consider it. Give it another five or ten years, I suspect it will come pretty much accepted. A bit like the, the, the case of the dinosaur asteroid. It's the same kind of time scale, maybe 10, 20 years. It takes that long for, you know, there's so much momentum in science. These, these old theories, you have to, you kind of have to, uh, people get very attached to them. Uh, they, spend a lot, they, spend a, they spend a lot of time doing their research into these ideas and when it turns out that they're they're wrong it, it's really hard for some people to give them up so it just takes time did you notice that in your other in your previous career and like or or the other work you do in chemical engineering at all no no not <laughs> Actually, not a lot of dogma there no. at all uh, no uh, mm -hmm. in my field in my field um chemical physics it's um you know i would say that people are Hardcore scientists, they're good scientists, hardcore scientists. And if evidence comes along, they look at it, they, they measure it up, mm. they consider it. And if it requires a change in the way of thinking, yeah, you know, it, it, takes, it takes just a couple of years for the message to get out. Oh, well, and then, you know, there is, there, there is none of this dogma in the field that I work in. That's it's interesting. Alien. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Is it just because it has less of a cultural impact or it says less about us as humans or something like that? There's no room for for personal 
Um, and bias? Or? Well, not that. It's even like archaeology in whole is just like a couple of things and then a lot of, a lot um, of changes. conceptualization. You're saying that that I science is a little more subjective than the chemical Yeah, it's super subjective than chemical, way more subjective than chemical. I would say like chemical engineering is like 5% subjective and that's probably on the R&D end of it. And, you know, maybe more, I'm sure Martin can correct me. And then, you know, archaeology is like 95% subjective. I think you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. Yeah. (laughs) In my field, the the evidence is is clear, you know. Um, you, You can debate about the methods that are used and maybe there are some problems with some of the methods and then, you know, you, you kind of refine those. But you know, it doesn't take long normally to, to get to like a, a clear view if there's, a, if there's some kind of problem that's, that needs solving. But if you're talking about archaeology and anthropology, it's, it, they're, they're talking about events that are so far in the past, it's very difficult to know what happened then. And, um, and particularly archaeology, but also anthropology, Less so the climate scientists and the geologists and so on. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're good scientists in the main. But if you're talking about many of the archaeologists and anthropologists, they're not scientists. They talk about archaeological science, but they don't do science. They're not. They, they are they're right in the middle of what I would call humanities. Uh, and and the, the whole way that the scholarship in the humanities works is completely different to science. And, and I think there is this problem that so much of uh, the humanities, it, a lot of it is based on, if you like, storytelling. Uh, and so you, you sort of create this story, which you, th- which you kind of think might be correct. And then that story just kind of perpetuates. It doesn't really get challenged because the evidence is, is very difficult to, to find that challenges it. And so this, this story just gains a life of its own. And, and the people that sort of promulgate the, these stories, um, you know, that they're sort of their, their position in academia is a lot of it is based on um, their sort of reputation, uh, and so it, it's it's so much harder to to push back against that. Yeah, in a way, it's we, like high end mythology. Archaeology yeah. is like high end yeah. mythology. It reminds me yeah, of, uh, and maybe not even that high end. A You're, lot of a lot of these humanities, the archaeology, anthropology, it is itself more like a religion. And let's be honest, it's like white dudes interpreting ancient people's stuff under their religious whatever. Well, know? I wouldn't want to, I don't want to categorize it like that. I mean, all right, you know, sorry. I was some world, sorry for but, being racist, Graham. So, but it does remind me of our, like we had an interview with James Brown who who gave us a completely different view on the Egyptians. Like his, his theory is uh, the electric Egyptians. Like they were playing around with static electricity and stuff. And a lot of their hieroglyphs showed that. And I mean, so... It was interesting to, to learn about the dogma about how people just think that, you know, because somebody said it in the early 1900s, this is what a hieroglyph means. Um, you know, we've thought that ever since and nobody's really challenged it. But he comes along with this whole new theory about how they were um, harnessing static electricity. And it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm, uh, I'm going <laughs> to. You don't have to comment on <laughs> that. Cautious there. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's, but it's just good, really good to look at it a different way. That's all. <laughs> But what was that? Yeah, I, I don't read. I don't read hieroglyphs. I mean, there there are these, you know, the the the, the Baghdad batteries and so forth. Yeah, so it's yeah. possible. You know, it's possible yeah. they were doing things like electro electroplating, and then well, if they could do that, then why not? Maybe some kind of lighting. But they well, were yeah, up, it was just they were the, sim- simple things like the the hand mirror that they that they have or they're, they're always holding. Like people were just making up that that was. Uh, that was a, I think there was supposed to be a hand mirror or something, or I can't, I can't remember what the, the, uh, the current, uh, you know, the mainstream view of what that object was that you see it all over the place. And he was saying that that could be a way to, uh, to, to grab static electricity. So it was, it, you know, just, it's just the interesting hand. things like that. Like, it, and it was just a, a, a like a, a disc shaped thing with a handle on it that you see everywhere. Yeah. That's, I think what you're referring to there is called the menat. So it's part of um, some kind of ornament that um, Egyptians would wear. Yeah, It's yeah. Particularly, as- particularly associated with the goddess Hathor. And I've had a discussion about this uh, oh, wow. with, <laughs> with an archaeologist. And, uh, yeah, so my view is that that could actually be representing a comet. It's got a classic comet shape. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. 
the disc with the tail. Yeah. We see that that shape quite often. And you know, if if these Egyptian gods, if if their if their mythology and religion actually is um, much much older than conventionally thought, so if it, if, it, if it's obtained from a much older civilization, and that civilization, because of the younger Dryas event, was basically all about comets, then it kind of makes sense that you should see a lot of comet symbolism, uh, even in modern day. Um, religions that comet symbolism might have survived so i suspect that that cop that that menat shape well, it, it's possibly a uh, just a comet <laughs> what, what do they think possibly. what do they think it is or what did he think it was what, do you remember what that well, i mean everyone everyone has to speculate about it i think um off the top of my head i can't remember there is there is some kind of explanation it's got something to do with um Flowers or something like this. I, I'm not entirely sure. Flowers, in flowers everywhere. Well, I mean, there's a temple in India that's carved out of a single piece of stone. So they were up to something. I mean, I don't know what it was, but I mean, that shit's crazy. Oh, so, yeah, tons of mysteries. You know, and they were doing this on the side of dodging comets. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it all seems so crazy to me. But to the one in India, I'd like to go there. India's pretty safe too, I think, right? Safe how? Like to travel? Well, depends on your definition. Yeah. yeah. So again, the um, you know, the Indian mythology and religion, according to this idea, it should all be connected to, well, you know, all the Egyptian stuff and the Indo-European religions. So yeah, it's likely that the comet symbolism is there in in the uh, Indian religions too. I'm wondering how the Vedas, because I'm trying to think of all those like old Vedic time. Kali Yuga and all the that. Kali Yugas, and I'm trying to remember what all the times of those, but I'm pretty sure those all lined up with the great year cycles and everything else. Right? I wonder if there's a three. Yeah. Th so the Mayan calendar was what, 5,000 and some? Yeah, I don't know about the specific time periods, but the, the whole concept that you can have these sort of cycles of time with destructions followed by civilization starting again, that's such a common theme throughout pretty much all the worlds. Well, not all the worlds, but many of the world's religions, uh, including the Indian, uh, the ancient Indian, sort of the Vedic and, and Kali Yuga stuff. So, yeah, that's all part of it, I suspect. Yeah. And if oh, you think yeah, about that... another, another, another really interesting connection, I guess, I talk, this, talk about this in the book, is um, the, the trident. So we're familiar with the trident from, um, uh, you've got Poseidon, uh, you've got the, sort of the devil with his trident. Well, the trident appears is connected with all sorts of deities, Indo-European deities. Uh, so if you go into India, you'll see Shiva, and Shiva has the trident. Uh, so this trident kind of connects all this mythology as well. Yeah. And in fact, there is, um, there is a stone. I, have I got a picture of it? I will find a picture of this stone that was found in Gebekli Tepe. Hang on, let's see if I can... Uh, the Mayan calendar was 5,125 I was going to say 5,120. Wow. You would have been off and by that's five the, years. And that's the, that's the quarter of the, uh, is it the quarter? Mm -hmm. The quarter of the great year? It would be a fifth. A fifth of the great year. It wouldn't, it's right. not, it's not Here really on that, but it might be on like two of those fucking wallops. Yeah. All right. So this, this stone was found at Kabaki Tepe. The trident? And hmm. I need to turn it around. Hang on. There we go. So the, the archaeologists interpret this as um, a bird. Well, the, the, archaeologists, the archaeologists see it this way up, actually. They see it as a bird, and then a tree or a person, and then a, uh, maybe a snake. Whereas I suspect, if you turn it around, this is the trident. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this, is, this, means, this means comet god, I suspect. And again, you, you can link that to... Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a pillar at Quebec Tepe which has a similar motif on it, so I suspect this trident is means comet god, and this means basically an airburst. I suspect this is some kind of explosion, and this is the cosmic chaos serpent. So this is a very familiar, very um, well known myth in practically all of these ancient religions, where there is the by, where sort of destruction and chaos is represented by a snake or a serpent that that falls to earth. And again, that's that's I suspect some kind of meteor or, or comet that's 
impacting Earth. So what you've got here is the comet god attacks or destroys the cosmic chaos serpent that falls to Earth. And that story is to- retold across thousands of years in all sorts of different religions. You, you can go to the Norse myths, you can go to the Indian myths, you can go to the Egyptian myths. It's the same story. There you have it. So we'll what, have to get you and Dave Matheson together. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Are you, are you going to be heading back to Gobekli Tepe at all? Is there, is there more research to be done there? and or Is there anything else that uh, you want to mention from your book? Uh, to be honest, I haven't actually been to Gobekli Tepe. <laughs> Perfect. So when's the so first this, trip? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm planning to write another book. Um, perhaps in another in a couple of years' time. So at the moment, I'm sort of collecting more stories, more evidence, uh, and some of that will go on. Some of that you can see on my blog. So my blog is martinsweatman.blogspot.com. So you can see lots of these uh, the sort of discoveries that we're we're finding all the time on the blog. And then uh, I plan to write another book, a sort of follow up to the to the current one, perhaps in a couple of years' time, which which brings lots of that evidence together to, to create another sort of coherent story nice did we catch did we do do we forget about anything in your book that we should talk about i think we've covered a lot haven't we yeah, yeah um, we seem to yeah, yeah. any plans yeah, to come over to uh this side of the pond anytime soon over to america um to the americas uh don't have any plans but i think for the next book it would be really good i think i would need to actually get on my bike and go traveling and uh yeah you know actually take some pictures and uh get around a bit so yeah it could be could be yeah we were going over go. the randall was showing us uh, we were doing some mound presentations and stuff on the ohio mounds and the and how those even have celestial and uh, astronomical alignments and, and stuff so it's it's pretty interesting this is going to be like you know Pretty soon we'll realize that globally they were paying attention to the, to the sky and designing their their structures around it. Absolutely. Well, yeah, right on. Go ahead. So I just come back to that to that point as well. You, you mentioned it earlier, and I didn't quite get to answering it. But these these events might not have been a complete surprise. So it may have been because this um, you'd be able to monitor mm-hmm. this comet as it's orbiting around. And probably there'll be maybe, you know, 10 years or maybe even 100 years when you can see that this comet is getting sort of closer and closer as it as it goes through its orbit. And there'll be, so they may have been able to actually kind of, maybe not predict, but they would have had some kind of, I don't know, maybe a prophecy of, of doom or something when that they, you know, they could expect maybe in 10 years time that we're going to get, uh, we're going to get hit. And so we need to prepare for it. There could have been that going on. So it may not have been a complete sudden surprise each time this happened. Yeah, I agree. And there might have been more of a verbal, you know, they might have been the stories, you know, telling each other the stories of since the flood, uh, the flood myths are all over the world. I mean, they might have been, you know, very accurate in their storytelling to each other as well as what happens to match, to match, like watching the sky. Three weeks Thursday. What's three weeks Thursday? The Torrid? Boom. The Torrid? I don't know. No, I'm just What's picking three, a day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Picking hmm. a day for the end of the world, bro. Yeah. Well, we're actually going through the the the, um, the beta torrids and the eta perseids right now. Oh, the perseids. So these, these are the these are the daytime torrids. It's the same meteor stream, but it's coming from a different direction from from the direction um, near the sun. So we can't see it because it's a daytime. I think some of the myths uh, say the last one came from the direction of the sun. Ah, all right. Look, that's interesting. That's some yeah. motherfucker hidden. Hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight until, <laughs> boom. I think we'll get a couple years' notice. Hopefully a couple days anyway, enough to get my affairs in order. <laughs> <laughs> I got a cave picked out in the mountains here, not far from the <laughs> studio. It's about an hour's drive from the studio. we got to start yeah, packing we, some supplies into that cave. Little bug out bag. You need, to learn nope. all your, you need to learn all your hunting and gathering skills. I know, that's the thing. I don't even, I don't even want to hunt. That's it. Darren wants to, so it won't be much of an adjustment for him. No, that's it. I'll be good to go. I'll be good to go, and we might come to England one day, and we'll come and visit you. Yeah, yeah, we'll let you know if we're there. We might do a little. Right. We might do a little uh, event out there or something. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. really. 
Excellent. Right on, Martin. Well, thanks for taking some time out of your Saturday night and uh, chatting with us here. We appreciate it. Yeah, we'll put links to all your stuff in the show notes. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thanks yeah, a lot. Come back anytime. Cheers. Okay. Thank okay. You. Bye yeah. for now. That was our chat with Martin Sweatman. That was pretty interesting. It was good to get some different graphs on there and the, the weather, extreme weather, weather stuff. Not weather, climate, I guess, back then. I don't want to call it weather. I'll be in trouble. What do you think? It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of uh, interesting. It's always a weird dynamic to be in the studio on a Saturday afternoon. But uh, it was great. Yeah, loved it. I like how it all sort of fits in with some of Randall's work and some of Dave Matheson's stuff, and it's kind of almost like a bridge between them, you know, which is interesting. Still a bit subjective, the constellations being, you know, the path of the towards and all that, but I can see how, I mean, if the thing that, that I always have to keep in mind is that they were paying attention to that. It's not just like you're pulling the celestial stuff out of, out of your, you know. Well, that's where I'd like to get Dave in and see about the constellations because he'd like, he'd pick up on all that stuff real yeah. quick, right? Yeah. He's looking at the constellations nonstop. And I've often thought there's no way they would have the same, you know, we've talked about it before, how the Sphinx wouldn't have been, there's no guarantee it was Leo then. Yeah, I didn't realize it was uh, changed at Mesopotamia. They, they changed. Well, I don't know if that's where it changed. That's where the Illuminati got together. Change that shit. Those bastards. They're like, we got to take over this stuff. No I'm sure people. they had No best. more people writing on tablets. I'm so sure they, they had writing the on tablets. They're like, we got to get control of this stuff. I'm sure they had the best of intentions. No, probably not. Anyway, big thanks to Martin for coming on the show. Check out his stuff over at martinsweatman.com. I don't, I don't know if that's a website or not, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's Martin. <laughs> it's just throwing it out there. <laughs> What a guy. It's <laughs> martinsweatman.blogspot.com. So close. Yeah. That'll be in the show notes. Uh, yeah, big thanks to Martin. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks to those of you who choose to support the show, grammarica.ca slash support. Uh, without you guys, there is no show. So instead of um, <clears throat> instead of feeling guilty, head over to grammarica.ca slash support today and become one of those people that support the show and become one of the reasons why the show exists. Other than that, Thank you guys for listening. Do all the stuff in the show notes. Review the show. Share the show. Sign people up for the newsletter. Be kind to people. Anything else? That's about it. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Season's greetings from the Grimerica Show podcast. Gather around the fireplace. Help yourself to some hot cocoa with the little marshmallows in it. Maybe have a candy cane or two. And maybe some cookies. It's so warm and jolly. Cry Merry Christmas. Podcasting from the igloo. Darren plays jingle bells on the didgeridoo. And over there that's Graham crying tears of joy. As he listens in on the little drummer boy, pum pum pum. I see you've acquainted yourself with D Ron. Yeah, it's true, he puffs Christmas trees of medicinal. Wait a second, is that? Yeah, I think that's Sasquatch beneath the mistletoe. Get over here, Graham. Thank you for saving me and give me a kiss. And it looks like Napoleon Doom is decorating the room. With tinsels, ribbon, popcorn, on strings, and poinsettias, they are in bloom. And you might ask, who's that in the green and red Lucia Libre mask? Why, of course, that's RPJ, Feliz Navidad. It's so warm and jolly. Cry Merry Christmas. Podcasting from the igloo. Darren plays jingle bells on the didgeridoo And over there that's Graham crying tears of joy As he listens in on the little drummer boy You'll get a warm and fuzzy feeling if you donate to the Grind America show So get in the spirit, reach down in your pocket and make it rain I mean, uh, let it snow, make it snow, let it snow, let it snow, make it snow Donate to the show, donate to the show Donate to the show.
It's so warm and jolly. Cry Merry Christmas. Podcasting from the igloo. Terry plays jingle bells on the didgeridoo. And over there, that's Graham crying tears of joy. As he listens in on the little drummer boy. Boom, 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 boom.